and we welcome you back to a driver's user experience, which is kind of a living room on wheels, and uh, uh, what that means we will learn in a minute from... From Sebastian Stegmüller. Um, he is head of mobile innovations, the, the research department for mobile innovations at the Fraunhofer IAO, which is the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering. So mm -hmm. we are we both have the same contract with Munich. Um, <laughs> we both are head of departments. Um, and what you most of you don't know what Fraunhofer is, right? Hands up who knows what that is. Oh uh, yeah, that's most of you. Yeah, Tina, you should know. Um, so uh, most Fraunhofer institutes are working on technologies um, or they develop technologies for the industry. So it's applied research. But the IAO is specific in that because for industrial engineering, they are doing a lot of um, more um, studies on how, to how everything works and how to work together with industries. And uh, we want to hear from Sebastian what is specific about <laughs> what he's doing, but right now he gets an adjustment of his microphone. So let's see. Um, otherwise, I just talk about what you're doing. Um, so, <laughs> um, well, we'll see. Um, as we will talk about the driver's UX, um, the Fraunhofer IAO is working with a lot of companies in the um, automotive industry. And now your mic is on, right? Or maybe Phoenix has to jump he up. He has to, to jump <laughs> up to the. To the, <laughs> the same guy. He's <laughs> 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 not digital. <laughs> <laughs> He's not digital. <coughs> now. Okay. Yeah, now it works. So, um, yeah, what we are doing is mainly um, innovation and technology management. And um <coughs> I'm head of a, a, a special research team, um, especially on the topic of, of the future of the automotive industry. So, what we are doing is um, research on very, very early steps of the innovation process when it comes to radical innovations um, for automotive players. So um, everything started 10 years ago with Tesla because before um, doing innovation topics in the automotive industry was more or less very boring because um, we had these uh, super players, the, the OEMs, the established players, the tier one companies, and they um, more or less knew exactly how to build a car and what will be next <laughs> on, the, on the plan. And then there came um, Tesla on the market and they showed that it's that it is possible that also companies from outside the established industry can build uh, cars and can bring in new technologies and new innovations. And, <coughs> and that mm, during that time, we started um, with our research team um, to think about possible innovations outside of the automotive industry and how they might uh, influence the automotive industry. And during the last 10 years, there had been also some other very, um, yeah, interesting uh, new technologies like connected cars, shared mobility, autonomous driving, and so on. And all these um, different uh, trends come together right now. And the automotive industry does have more or less the, yeah, the challenge to, to understand at, at these very early steps, which might be an interesting project to do, and which might be not that interesting because another company can do it better as, as they can do. And so I think in future, um, the main challenge for the automotive industry and those players would be also to, um, to partner more with other industries. And I think this is very interesting when it comes to, to media, yeah? um, because I think there will be um, in future um, service providers and media providers might work together with, with companies of the automotive industry to es establish something like a um, total new mobility experience. Yeah? Think about autonomous driving and what you do in the car. This is more or less the topic what we do our research about um, right now in those days. Mm. In, in, in that environment of Fraunhofer, I would call you guys the geeks and not the nerds because <laughs> you're, you, you talk much more with the industry. You're not mm. totally uh, non-emotional responding dudes. You're not in your, um, in your small room and work on the algorithm. Mm -hmm. You work with the customers directly. And you understand yes. uh, what they need. Um, yes, and, and also with our customers. So we work very close together with, with the companies but on the other hand, also with, with consumers. Uh, because if you think about this new mobility experience, um, this is something not that technology-driven driven anymore, but more, um, let's say, solution-driven mm -hmm. or service-driven. And of course, to, to offer a right solution for a consumer, it's very important to understand um, what kind of, of uh, technology or services or applications um, 
will provide an additional value for the consumer. And, and what we see right now in our work is that um, most of those companies, those established companies, um, think about new technologies and you do, do have ideas and perfect innovation processes, but quite often it's um, not easy for them to understand what is really interesting for their consumer because they have been used to, to build cars and they know everything about cars, but they don't know anything about, for example, media or entertainment. Yeah. And this is a new challenge for them, and we try to help um, those guys um, on the one hand side by, by doing studies, but on the other hand also by doing research about new innovation processes and new lean innovation methods. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to Kathleen is a native of Washington, D.C. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur in a variety of industries, security, finance, uh, IT and has a background in engineering and computer science and business. So there is a lot of interdisciplinary know-how combined in one person who is today uh, working at Ambition, Mercedes-Benz Innovation Lab uh, in Berlin. What are you guys doing there at Ambition? Well, it, it's our job to <coughs> come up with the software factory that goes alongside the car factory for, for Daimler. So we understand uh, that in the future, it's not just about how well can we bend sheet metal, but actually what kind of experiences can we give to our customers that set us apart from the other brands. And in order to do that, we have come to understand that it's not possible just to, to outsource this to tier ones and to, to partners, but we need to bring a certain amount of understanding in-house. And that's what the ambition is. It is the the part of Daimler that is teaching Daimler how to build software and how to be a services company. So it has nothing to do with the traditional brick and mortar, single thing and uh, vehicle plant in a way. Or how is your per the I mean sometimes with the innovation labs that are located in Berlin, that uh, I, I sometimes have the feeling that the well the innovation guys are are in Berlin and then there are these brick and mortar. Uh, 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 home bases of the large corporates somewhere else, uh, and these, these two don't really talk to each other. How does that work? Uh, is, is it like that, or is it totally different? I, uh, for better or for worse, we are working <laughs> very closely with our colleagues okay. in Sindelfingen <coughs> and also our colleagues from, from Daimler around the world, cool. uh, particularly Daimler in, in China and also Daimler in the United States in Sunnyvale, which is where they do a lot of the, the user experience research for the, the new cars. Do they also do that in China, the user experience? Well, uh, what is expected from our customers in China is very different from what's expected from our customers in Europe and in the United States. And as we are building the future platforms, and when I say pu future, I mean not the next generation, but the generation after next. And so we have to understand not just, okay, what do people want today, but what could they potentially want tomorrow? And what kind of technologies, uh, what kind of hardware, what kind of concepts do we need to build into the car so that when in 2022, 2025, 2030, our cars are being driven, that they're still able to fulfill all of these customer expectations. When we're talking about generations of cars and generations of technologies, we're talking about generation of cars, uh, which probably takes many, many more years to develop a car until it's rolling off out of a plant somewhere. Uh, when, I, when I'm thinking about IT and tech innovation and how often we get new cell phones and everything, how does that match? How, you, how do you really integrate technology and, and all of these things into something that takes so long in the planning and, and uh, regulation and whatever phase uh, as a car? In, in general, it takes about five years from the point when a new car is going to be like conceptualized to when it actually starts getting manufactured. And that means that in general, uh, the hardware, the software, all the things are frozen at some point years in advance of it ever getting to the showroom floor. And to give you an idea, the first iPhone came out in 2001, and now we're almost in 2020, so 19 years later and we're at the iPhone X, S, R, whatever, 14 generations of iPhone later. And if you look at this sort of five year uh, tact, that means there's been approximately three generations of cars in the same amount of time. Uh, and also when you, when you buy a cell phone, most people don't hold onto their cell phone for more than a couple of years at, at most. Uh, and then you buy a new one, and what do you get? You get a much faster experience, much more memory, bigger screen, cooler sensors, things like that. But the, the, the same isn't necessarily true of cars. So part of how we want to address this discrepancy between how people 
by phones and how people use their cars is by separating the development of the hardware, so the car, the thing, the sheet metal, the factory, uh, all of that stuff, from the development and the delivery of the software. Up until now, uh, it's been treated the same way. So if you have a car that comes off the line, the software that's developed for that car goes through the same sort of quality gates and processes. There's a final sign-off, and then that is the software that's delivered in the car. A couple of years later, you maybe get an update. A couple of years later, you get maybe get an update. But that means that the, the whole development process for the software in the car is treated the same way as the hardware. And that's, that has to change. Does that mean um, that all the automotive uh, companies do have to understand how to become a tech company? I, I think one way or the other, they need to be able to offer to their customers a compelling experience. Uh, if they're unable to offer to their customers a compelling experience, then they are, and now speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of Daimler, they're, they are doomed to become a generic sheet metal bending company. Right, And so we heard already that Tesla 10 years ago sort of shook up this innovative research area because, oh man, someone who's not a car company can build cars. Uh, and I think that as much as Tesla is building cars, they're at their core, they, they run like a technology company. They run like they're providing services to their customers. They're very customer oriented. They're doing a fantastic job. And so we heard recently they're going to be building a factory in, in Brandenburg outside of Berlin in order to, I would imagine, get a little bit better at the sheet metal bending part. And so I find it kind of funny that at the same time that a company like Tesla is coming to Germany to learn how to bend sheet metal better, the German car companies are looking at Tesla and saying, oh man, they're really, really good with their software, and their their in-car entertainment is fantastic, and that's the, the new gold standard. How do we catch up? What do we need to do? <coughs> Sebastian, you're involved in early phases of mm -hmm. uh, all of these changes uh, at Fraunhofer. Um, how does it look from your perspective? I mean, starting maybe, I don't know, from a Tesla shock or maybe earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and... and <coughs> yeah, do yeah, um... Let, let me drop the ball. I think the last question was very interesting, whether the, the automakers should become a, a tech company. And maybe this is the wrong way, because um, they are very good in bringing technology from different companies together and build one, one product, because even today, a car is not built by an um, by uh, 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 automaker, but by an automaker together with all the suppliers. And this is also a fact why Tesla goes to Germany, because um, even today many of their suppliers are out of Germany. Um, but so maybe in future they should not um, think about becoming a technology company, but becoming something like an experience company or a, a service company. And then to bring together the technologies of, of the suppliers from today, but maybe also from other player, players like Google or maybe also Apple, if Apple wants to do so, yeah, bring it together and then build up uh, a totally new product, which is a car, but a, a car with additional services and additional application that offers uh, a, a total new ex experience. And I think um, nobody can do this that good as the, the automakers, because for a technology a company, they can um, develop technology, but they do not have that knowledge in bringing together technologies from many players and building up one premium um, product. Mm -hmm. So the premium product, which is a car, would be the mm -hmm. platform for all the different technologies yeah, that I come together yeah. to make it a wonderful user experience. Yes, yes, I think that that, that could be a, a good way, especially for the German um, for the German brands, because they have very strong brands, and you know most of our car companies do have these these luxury markets. And just think about um, Porsche, to name another um, uh, company out of Stuttgart. Porsche um, does have the highest earnings per car, but they do have the, the smallest own value creation within the production. They are just super good in bringing together parts from other companies. Oh, I didn't know that. I just thought I would never have a Porsche. But <laughs> 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 right. By the way, um, I mean, we're chatting here, yeah, and oh, yeah. I'm sitting up front, uh, but cool. of course all of you are invited to raise your hand and ask questions, just wave in the direction of of Alina, she has a microphone and will be happy to carry it around. So mm -hmm. we have the experts here today. They're not here anymore uh, in a couple of days. So 
uh, use the opportunity while we continue our, our chat. Exactly. As we don't see raising hands at this <laughs> moment, at least. So oh, we have one already. Oh, oh, but the first hands are rising. Yeah. <coughs> if if we don't have enough questions, then I'll start asking the audience questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have enough. I have a, I have yeah. enough <laughs> questions too. <laughs> but we don't want to make it a Sven and Kathleen show. That's why we're asking the audience too. Thank you very much for you uh, the insights that both of you have given. Um, the, the title of the talk is Living Room on Four, Four Wheels, um, and we've really only talked about technology in its sort of very, um, you know, uh, in its widest possible um, application. When we're talking about a living room, um, we think about entertainment, clearly, um, but I was just having a, a word with my, my neighbor here. Um, <coughs> do you think that people will want immersive entertainment? in this living room on four wheels? Or will they want a completely different entertainment experience to that which we've had elsewhere or in the past or thus far? Um, and uh, if so, what, what, um, what role does audio take? Mm. Because audio has always been important in cars through the radio. And now, obviously, if people want to look at the scenery, um, what, what is what is there going to be designed? Is that part of what you're doing? Is that part of the experience that you're wanting to give <coughs> to drivers of the or the sorry drivingers of the future because they won't be driving clearly. Drivingers. Well, oh they're yeah, sort of they're not really yeah. they're sort of they're just sort well of there. Along they're there. The ride. Yes, yeah. and and that's a cool word. Yeah. Nominally, in uh, I coined it, Kathleen. <laughs> 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 okay, we um we quote you. Later. <laughs> so <f> first <laughs> of all, fan fantastic question, and uh, I think the the short answer to the the first part of your question is yes. Uh, so people will want immersive experiences. They will want the same experiences. They will want completely new ones. Uh, people will want everything, and uh, depending on where you are in the world, there are different things that people will want, and we have to plan to be able to provide all of that. When, when it comes to, to audio, I think it's interesting that for a lot of people, their, their car stereo system is the nicest audio system they have, and, and they go to their car to, to sit and listen <laughs> to, to some of their favorite albums. When, when we think about the, the topic living room and four wheels, uh, it, it brings in these topics like autonomous far, uh, autonomous far, uh, automa driving autonomous automatically, autonomous, autonomous driving. driving. Uh, where where there's someone maybe at the wheel or not really, and then that st starts to open up new uh, possibilities <coughs> in terms of seating arrangements, in terms of displays of information, audio, visual. Uh, we do a lot with speech at uh, Ambition, and uh, also other forms of entertainment. So you mentioned when people are looking out the window, uh, what happens when people look into a different world, so when they're wearing uh, VR goggles? I think uh, yesterday we had this topic, uh, what happens when the family is traveling together and they don't want to look at each other anymore? You know, c can they, they do that? Can they take themselves completely out of the environment they're that they're in and, and go somewhere else? But at the same time, uh, maybe they want to bring more people into the car with... Uh, telepresence technologies and having business calls while they're they're going along the highway. I think I it's very difficult to say concretely what people will want in the future. So we have the, the unfortunate restriction that we have to think about uh, the kinds of experiences that we want to deliver that if one becomes popular in one area or another becomes popular, that it's all possible. So it's really about creating the possibilities, the space for these different experiences to be created, not necessarily by, by a Daimler, uh, potentially by, by third parties or, or partners, uh, that the, <coughs> the customers can have a good experience in the vehicles of the future. But how, how are you trying to evaluate that, or probably have to look more into your direction then? Uh, how are you trying to evaluate these things that you don't know yet? Because these cars, of course, are not there yet, and they're not driving autonomously from Munich to Berlin, so everybody inside gets bored, and I have no idea how to fade out the kids yet. So <laughs> the, uh, uh, how do you make sure that you're, you're well, kind of going in the right direction? Mm -hmm. Well, wh what we do um, on, on the one hand side, um, we do tests and experiments with, with customers 
and with um, very um, yeah early stage prototypes or prototypes. So it's not about building a perfect prototype that you can show at the um, at the auto fair, but it's more about building experiment and trying to understand and comparing technologies with, with each other. For example, we do have a, a mock-up with a huge screen, and you can try to, to watch uh, the series or a movie on your, on your tablet or on the huge screen, or we also have a projection on the windshield. So the whole windshield is one, um, <coughs> or can be <coughs> one large screen. And then we can, of, of course, it's not a technology that you can bring in a car today, because it's, it's a projector outside, and we do have a, um, yeah, a switchable glass. But we can even today evaluate whether there are possible applications um, with, with the need for such a huge screen. And so this is on the one hand side very interesting, but on the other hand, I think it's also important to look on data and to think about when and at which situation are people driving and might have the opportunity to use those, those, um, those features. And I think this is very interesting when it comes to a question of the living room and about what kind of entertainment might be interesting. Because I think, um, ju just let me give, give a the concrete of example of my daily life. Um, I have to drive 60 kilometers from my home to, to the office every day. So this is one day at morning and another, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> one hour at morning and another um, hour at evening. So two hours every day I spend in my car. So um, sometimes it's driving time, sometimes it's driving pleasure. But um, if I'm being in the car, of course, the car is something like a driving room. But in future, if the car would be autonomous, it would be a living room. But um, the time would not be the same time um, that I use uh, today for uh, consuming entertainment when I'm at home. Because, of course, I'm driving at morning to the office, and I, I don't think I would like to consume the same kind <coughs> of media um, at morning going to the office that I would like to um, consume an afternoon or the evening. And so I think there will be a, a need for new formats and for a new kind of media, for a new kind of entertainment. So all of a sudden car manufacturers <coughs> have to deal with content and content providing and provisioning or the, so you're, you're, you're becoming, uh, having a new role as well. So Daimler is not only a new media company because you're doing, I don't know, e-learning or what, but because you have to purchase contents of, of different variations. Absolutely, <coughs> when, when you have created this living room on four wheels and you're, you're bringing customers into it, uh, they have to experience something other than looking out the, the window, which is a completely legitimate thing to do as, as a passenger in a car. But it's also completely legitimate to have a conference call to, to watch a, a video. And I think that's also uh, partially the, the answer to your question is that we can't know for sure what people will be doing uh, in cars in the future. But that doesn't mean that we're, we're hopeless and just whatever happens, happens. We have to plan for the unplannable, meaning we need to be able, uh, so the word that gets abused a lot is agile. Uh, we have to be agile, we have to be flexible, we have to be able to quickly react to a market trend or a demand and be able to express that uh, not in a cycle of five years, not even in a cycle of five months, or maybe five weeks or five days, and be able to bring those experiences to the car. But, but I think what is interesting is, um, just think about platforms. Just think about we had the example of, of the iPhone, uh, uh, which is an, a very old one. Um, of course, um, the iPhone is interesting because of our smartphone is interesting because of the applications and all those apps. And of course, also Samsung and Apple are producing their own apps, but there are also other people outside. And this is more or less what is interesting about the platform that others can bring in their content more or less. And just think about Amazon. Amazon is also a platform, but they don't uh, produce books on their own or pullovers or whatever you can buy there. But they offer a platform where other people can bring in their content more or less. Uh, and I think that might be or could be also interesting for, for um, if you think about a car as a platform, that you provide a possibility for others to bring in their content. Of course, it would be interesting also to, to offer own content like a conference call version or e-learning and so on, but also to open it to others, and then you would have the flexibility um, <coughs> that the content can or will be produced um, related to the real demand of the future, not what you have to think about mm -hmm. today, but uh, it's about the demand of the future. And I think that brings us um, also um, back to the question of before, how to um, 
to think about is if this time it, it needs to to produce a car and software and it's even harder if you think about um, services and applications and and i think this is also one one challenge on the technical side of of developing a car to find ways that uh, third parties can offer their um yeah, the content later or then the media files or their services the applications at a car um but i think it, it can be solved i, I love this answer this is this is essentially my my job is finding a way for third parties to be able to bring their stuff into the car That's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have another question yeah I, I appreciate very much that you put uh, experience now in the middle of your uh, innovation strategy and i think it's uh, it's it's actually uh, a very big step forward for the German car industry that they actually <coughs> perceive these problems this way. What makes me what's make me a little bit nervous, uh, Sebastian, is actually the fact that that you come from Fraunhofer, when I understand this correctly, and you and you you kind of propagate a little bit more flexible approach to platforms like Apple and Google because I think it was a very right way that the German car makers have seen the risk that they would end up like Nokia did when they would basically accept the uh, international US driven platforms as the main kind of uh, platform and then they would basically just kind of degenerate into some kind of second level kind mm -hmm. of B2B business. And I think it's very important that on this point we kind of stand firm and we do not open up our um, communication networks to uh, platforms we cannot control as German industry. And I think that is a very important point. That's why it's so, so interesting that the person from, from, the, from the car company is actually standing firm and the person who is working halfway <laughs> for the German government is kind of propagating yeah. the... Nope. Inter no, not really for the German government, but also for the German government is kind of propagating this kind of sneaking in the, the Googles and the Apples into the system. So I, I, I really wanted to ask this question. Well, so please. Um, well, on one hand side, you're right, but... Um, talking about Apple and, and Google and Amazon that have been only uh, examples for platform companies. And it's not about that we should push to, to build up a, a platform company because we know that's not that easy at Europe. Um, but it's more or less to understand how a platform works. But um, as I'm from Fraunhofer and as I know about technologies of the future, I can also tell you about Web 3.0, uh, the new kind of... Uh, of the internet um, technology that will be here in five years or maybe in ten years, and then you would have the the possibility by technologies like blockchain, for example, to build up a network of many players, and you won't need a platform company anymore in the middle. So uh, an Uber, uh, an Uber <laughs> and Google or an Apple, who does have this this strong position in the market to be the the man in the middle won't be needed anymore with <coughs> this um, Web 3.0 technologies. And then it will be possible to build up a, uh, something like an ecosystem or a network that is a platform in itself. But it won't have these, these problems, what we do have with, with the, uh, the platforms we do have today. So blockchain aside, if you look at uh, platform companies the world over, so from the United States, you have Fang, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Amazon, Google. If you look in China, you have BAT, so Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, <laughs> and uh, these companies aren't going away. At Daimler, we took the conscious decision not to just say, okay, Google, okay, Apple, put your platform in our car. Uh, that's what everybody's asking for. There's the famous <coughs> quote from, from Henry Ford, you know, if I ask people what they wanted, they just want a faster horse. Uh, because we, we saw what happened with Nokia, quite honestly. And uh, I'm in a team of three system architects, and uh, one of them was working for, for Nokia at that time. And this it l left really this feeling of, of damage, actually, in this whole industry. Man, what happened to Nokia? How did that happen to them? They were like this big, strong company. So from, from the perspective of the auto manufacturers, it's and particularly for, for Daimler, it's how do we ensure that we are able to deliver the consistent quality that is expected of us from, from our customers. 
And the answer to that is not saying, okay, Google, control my car. That's for sure not the way. And uh, at the, the, the same time, we can't say, okay, no Google in our car because I was uh, having a conversation with someone at lunch and they said they bought their car based on the availability uh, for them to hook their iPhone up to it. So where does that leave us? There's this then sliver of uh, space where we can offer compelling experiences better than any of the, the technology companies and their platforms and ecosystems because we are manufacturing the car. We have the complete understanding of the data that's involved. We have access to the navigation. We know the vehicle dynamics better than anyone else. And then the, the tricky thing, the, the thing that we really have to nail is being able to translate this data, this experience, this knowledge into a user experience, into compelling, really customer-oriented stories that people can understand, right? Because at, at the end of the day, we're a sheet metal company. We're bending sheet metal into forms and people are standing in them and then today it's still little explosions and in the future maybe, maybe it's batteries. But everything on top of that is what our brand is and that we have to be able to continue to deliver. Another question. Um, you mentioned uh, the fact that um, you manufacture cars and you're not sure what the consumer of the future is really going to, is going to want. And I hark back to the games industry and to VR and, and uh, other forms of reality where um, it was never one side that drove the other. It was never the hardware that drove the software or the software that drove the hardware. They sort of leapfrogged in terms. And so VR is a particular case in point where um, it's it, this is on its what third iteration now, I think, since 1995 or something, when the hardware just wasn't working. So there was no real point on working in working on the software because it wasn't really working. So do you think that that is going to be the sort of synergic or synergistic um, uh, way that a company like Daimler or like Mercedes-Benz is going to take where you create the communities around your product so that you understand in advance what people are going to be wanting or what they're demanding? Is that, is that how you see the future? S since that's uh, seemingly how the, the uh, hardware and software of the games industry and related industries have developed over the past 15 years. Mm. First, a personal, uh, personal anecdote. So in 1993, I had the VFX One. This was, I think, the first commercial uh, VR headset. And you could play, I think, Magic Carpet and Doom and Descent and all the sort of early 90s 3D games. And I got horribly sick, but I loved it. So I'd put it on and then 10 minutes later take it off and you'll be violently ill and then run back and put it back on. <laughs> so uh, for sure, some technologies come out before they're ready. Uh, in, uh, back, back to the, the cars, I think we don't necessarily have to be certain what the, the customers in the future will want. Uh, we have a pretty good idea what they're going to want based on uh, trends in other industries, based on past behavior, based on studies, based on working wi with partners like Fraunhofer. And I think far more important is that we as an industry, learn to embrace this uncertainty that we can't say, okay, this is the car we're going to manufacture five years from now, and five years from that is this one, and five years from that is this one. And we don't have that certainty anymore. So maybe in terms of the sheet metal, yes, but in terms of the, the cars, no. So we look just, just in the automotive industry, just in the last five years, we look at the sort of mega trends, like the new mobility and car sharing and uh, how fleet management has changed and even financial instruments, how people purchase cars, do people purchase cars anymore? All of this is now radically different in 2019 than it was even in, in 2015. <coughs> and there's a, there's a little bit of my role, which is this technologist role, which is, okay, what will the, the future be? Uh, but, but the architect role is more, okay, it doesn't matter what the future is, th the answer is always yes. It's 
So can we do this? Yes. Can we do this? Yes. And then it's a question of how quickly can we do this? What processes do we need to change internally to be able to say yes and not yes in, in six years, but yes in six months? And uh, that's, that's really the challenge is being able to quickly react to these sort of micro trends and be able to ride the wave up rather than after it's already crashed, than trying to get in on it. You, Sebastian, <coughs> based on uh, what Jeff just said, we're, we're probably going to see a gradual move from where we are now to uh, having a completely autonomous driving car with all of its possibilities of, of a new kind of living room. <coughs> In these gradual um, fragments, what are we going to see first? I mean, uh, we already have cars that keep their distance and stay in the lane and that, mm -hmm. that give us certain possibilities that maybe we, we didn't have and we still should not use, yeah, or it's probably still forbidden, I don't know. But I, I use these features to check my phone more often. So where will that lead us in the future to a completely autonomous uh, car? Are you already experimenting with, uh, with things like that? Um, yes, we do, but I think it's important if we're talking about autonomous cars to, to understand that there are two, two directions more or less. There is the, the evolutionary way, what we see in the automotive industry, so that our cars <coughs> are more and more automated, and even today you can, can drive automated on the highway. And you can um, do other things, for example, um, um, listening to audio and on new kinds of audio formats on media. And then there, on the other hand, there is the, uh, the radical way of, of RoboCab, something like Google thought about. Um, so small cars, maybe large car, um, cars driving through cities, um, they are not any more owned by a person, but totally without a steering wheel. And of course, this is a different uh, future. And for us, it's very interesting. We have done last year uh, um, a survey on the topic of how might a, a RoboCab look like in the future. We asked people at USA, Germany, and China. And for us, it was <coughs> interesting when we talked with um, experts from the automotive industry, but also from um, public transport. And they have a totally different imagination how yeah. that car <laughs> might look like. <laughs> right? for, for me, it was interesting when I talked with those guys from, from public transport. Um, they are talking about, uh, I don't know the, the English word, I'm sorry, but in Germany they are talking about something like a Gefäß. So Gefäß is just a small room, and you could, could put in maybe two people or ten people or five people. This is important for those guys from public transport. For an uh, automotive company, uh, of course, they would never call their car a Gefäß because <laughs> it's about <laughs> emotions, <laughs> and it's about a brand. Yeah? Um, so it's uh, even there, it's very important about what kind of cars do you think. And if you think about those um, transport solutions for cities, I don't think they will be much uh, emotional, and I don't think they will um, offer much entertainment, because otherwise you could also do this today with a, with a bus. A bus is, whether it is driving autonomous or whether there is sitting a bus driver, it's not a, <laughs> um, for you, it, it doesn't change anything. But um, I think uh, if you think about the evolutionary way of cars, of traditional privately owned cars, um, then it's more interesting that they will become something like a living place. And, and going back to the example of commuting, uh, I think it's quite a, a huge market to think about commuters. And even with today's technology, with the cars of today, you can offer new kinds of, of media. The example with, with audio media, uh, today that's just a radio and maybe some, some podcast. But if I just would have the option to, to select what I <coughs> like to hear or the car ask me every morning, hello, Sebastian, you're on your way to the office. Uh, may you hear a new, um, I don't know, podcast from, from whoever. I think then I would use it. Uh, today I have to, to, to take out my smartphone and, and yeah, select a new file. But to make this more convenient, this could be a, a first step to a new experience, to new mobility experience. So you're, si you're actually thinking much more radical about these changes and, and, and experimenting mm -hmm. with much more radical approaches. Mm -hmm. And by the way, how does the car recognize that you are you? I mean, what if I take your car and it talks to me and plays me your music and I don't like it? <laughs> well, poo, it, de it depends. There are a couple of technologies. Well, today you, you just use the key. <laughs> it's just the key. And more or less, if I give my key to you, then you will hear my music. Um, but maybe that the in future, also, um, if you think about autonomous driving, of course, it's, it's and car sharing and things like that. Car sharing, also. yeah, yeah. Uh, then, then it's very important that the car also recognizes if you you still look on the 
of the, the street or if you are sleeping, for example. And so there will be some sensors who, yeah, maybe a camera who sees who is sitting in, but you can also, if you have um, <coughs> real knowledge mm -hmm. about your driver, I mean, to gather data about its driving behavior, then of course maybe you can also use that data to understand who is in the car. And I think it's then it will be very interesting if the car does have the possibility to predict what you want. So in which mood you are, which kind of music you would like to hear, because even today it's, it's I, I really want to hear a different music at morning or at afternoon um, when I'm driving home from my office or at weekend, during weekend or at the evening if I go to a party. Every time I want to hear two other kind of music. And sometimes I'm driving my car more, um, yeah, more relaxed and other times I'm driving it more sporty. And if the car would have the ability to understand how I would like to have my setup, I think then you can provide such a superior experience. But, um, well, this in the end is a question about technologies and to, to, to understand which technology might be the best one. I told you we are only doing our research in the first step. So we think about those innovations, about those applications. Maybe we can, um, yeah, find our colleagues <laughs> who are doing the research on technologies, but afterwards it's about uh, the guys from the automotive industry to, to realize those functions. Mm -hmm. We always say at Fraunhofer you know things or you have seen things that might be on the market in five years. Um, and you mentioned a timeline that could be 2022 or 2025, whatever. Like You could already see what is coming next in the cars. We're already using voice recognition Mm -hmm. um, yesterday we went to the speaker's dinner and Sven told his car to, to find the hotel. He just said it as a just normal sentence and it found <coughs> the hotel address. Um, so and, it tells and it tells the navigation system to shut up if I say shut up <laughs> instead of turn navigation system off or something like that. So, yeah. As long as the stuff doesn't say to you shut up. <laughs> that that never worked, no. Yeah. <laughs> you would still say that. So um, now uh, coming back uh, to see a series, the question. Um, now it already says the vo um, has voice recognition. What's the next steps? Is there the cameras are already working, or they already in the pipeline? They're they're for sure already in the pipeline. Starting I think 2020 or 2021, I don't remember which year in North America. In order to get a five star safety rating, you need to have a some way of understanding if the driver is paying attention to the road. And so the it would be cameras that are. Um, that see my eyes, that basically do eye tracking and see if, <coughs> I, if my eyes fall asleep, uh, if uh, I'm falling asleep. So there, there's lots of different ways to do it. Uh, my understanding is usually it will be either a camera in the instrument cluster pointed at you or in the rear view mirror or some other sensor in the car that understands not just uh, where your head is, but also where you are looking and potentially also vital signs are, it has your breathing slowed down, uh, have you started to nod off a little bit? Yeah. Uh, uh, for some reason, I thought that is already integrated in the s in the big trucks, like in the in the. the it, so um, our colleagues that are working on the the big trucks actually have have come to talk to us about. It's not exactly in car entertainment when you're talking about a truck, but for sure there is uh, something resembling an infotainment system uh, in these contexts. And it was actually really surprising to me the the amount of extra stuff that's actually in these commercial vehicles. It's above and beyond what's in the passenger cars already. So they already have their living whole room with them. Absolutely. Perfect. So thank you, Fine. Jeff. Thank you, thank you, Sebastian. Our our time is unfortunately already up, uh, and uh, I mean we see some of the stuff is happening gradually. Some has a more radical approach to it, redefining what the car of the future is. Uh, an iPhone on wheels or much more, thinking about content, thinking about data and how to integrate it all. It's an exciting future that we're going to have on the road. Um, thank you, uh, and give a big hand to, uh, to Jeff and Sebastian. Thank you.